Okay, well, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this, uh, uh, to be at this conference. I, I'm a relative newcomer to this area. I, I began this uh, research in 2010, uh, just a little over three years ago. Uh, and so I'm still learning a great amount uh, and have much more to learn. Uh, but as an academic, we tend to approach things a little differently than, uh, than um, policy professionals or, or, uh, uh, or others might. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it provides perhaps a different insight into, into, uh, uh, into this realm that you know uh, very well. So um, uh, this is work uh, with Michael Finley and Jason Sharman, my two co-authors. Um, and uh, and Shina Baradaran, uh, uh, a piece has been published in the Minnesota Law Review. Uh, a piece is forthcoming in the, in, the, in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review. Uh, and it's also forthcoming as a book uh, with Cambridge University Press, same title, Global Shell Games, different subtitle. Uh, the, 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 the publisher uh, encourages us to, to jazz it up a little bit. And so it's uh, uh, Experiments in Transnational Relations, Crime, and Terrorism. So uh, that's, uh, that, that was the concession to the, edit, the, the, the publisher. Um, if you're interested in any of those pieces, would like, uh, would like a copy, a PDF file, happy to, including for the book manuscript uh, before it's actually published. Um, and uh, uh, just email me at that email address, uh, dan underscore nielsen at byu.edu, and happy to send. Uh, we're, we're very interested. I mean, we're, we're not yet, you know, the, 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 the manuscript's not yet uh, finished. I should say that the manuscript is, we, 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 we fit it, we turn in the final draft, but there's still a chance to change and, and copy edit. So uh, if, there, if there are errors or other things, uh, we're, we're very interested in learning and, and correcting those before we go to final press. Um, let me begin uh, with a story that starts the book. Um, this is Lu Zhang. Uh, some of you are familiar with her, her story. Uh, many of us, uh, I certainly wasn't. Um, uh, she was a recent immigrant to New Zealand, uh, and she worked as a short oil cook at Burger King. Um, but little known to her, she was also a notorious uh, international financial criminal uh, and arms trader. Um, uh, the, uh, the Thai Special Forces apprehended uh, a, a cargo uh, a jet uh, that was on its way from North Korea to Iran, and its, and its uh, uh, hold was crammed with 3,000 pounds. Of, of weapons, uh, 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 anti-aircraft missiles, rocket launchers, uh, other kinds of things. Obviously, this is not a good thing when two of the three axes of evil are involved in, uh, in, an, uh, in, a, in, a, in an embargoed ar arms trade. Uh, and um, the manifest for the airplane uh, said that, it, that, it, that the, uh, the, the shipment was uh, commissioned by SP Trading Incorporated. Uh, it turns out that was a, a shell company. Uh, and and uh, Lu Zhang was the nominee director uh, of the of the shell, uh, and and 73 other shells. Uh, it turns out, um, it, it, to supplement her income, she was hired by the GD, GT Group in New Zealand uh, to sign whatever documents they put in front of her. Fifteen dollars a document, uh, and she became the nominee director of, of the 74 companies. Um, and uh, the New Zealand police finally released her when, when they realized she, had, she knew nothing whatsoever about the arms trade or about anything else uh, with these companies. Uh, she was just a patsy. Um, and and uh, what's interesting is that, is that uh, other than the fact that she'd given a false address, she'd given, she'd given her work address as the address of these companies instead of her home address. If she'd given her home address, no laws would have been broken. She was charged with 74 counts of false address, but immediately released when they realized that she knew nothing uh, of, of value. Uh, to the investigation. So, um, uh, some of you have heard of this uh, story too. This is a house in Wyoming uh, that houses um, Wyoming Corporate Services Incorporated. Um, and and uh, next to him, uh, or next to the house, is uh, Pavel Lazarenko. Um, he is uh, currently serving a nine year federal prison sentence in uh, California uh, for money laundering and fraud uh, and extortion. Um, uh, he was the former prime minister of Ukraine. Transparency International named him the eighth most corrupt politician of all time. Uh, and uh, uh, more on him in just a moment. So, um, so why only Corporate and Services Incorporated? Uh, this, you know, these are the kinds of this is the kind of organization that, that gives your industry, uh, a, 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 in, my, in my view, an undeserved bad name. Uh, and uh, uh, here's here's what here's what it is. Um, 
2,000 mailboxes in, in the main room of this small house in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, each one, ha the, the official residence, the official uh, address for, for a shell company. Um, and uh, uh, of course, as you know, uh, these are not uh, companies in the way that we think of, uh, think of them as having employees uh, or, or uh, pensions and so, and so forth. They're just uh, shell companies, legal persons that are still very important uh, for being legal fictions. So um, here's, here's what different companies at Wyoming Corporate Services Incorporated ha have been involved in. Uh, so uh, fraudulent uh, defense contracting, human trafficking, uh, in illegal internet poker, uh, subprime credit cards, and uh, they still shelter Pavel Lazarenko's considerable real estate assets that he has not yet uh, um, had removed from him. So. Um, so, um, as, you, as you probably read in the program, uh, my, my collaborators and I uh, posed as consultants, uh, assumed aliases, uh, and sent thousands of inquiries to uh, corporate service providers around the world uh, asking for anonymous shell companies. This is one of the answers we got from a Canadian firm responding to our Papua, Papua New Guinea alias uh, that claimed, uh, claimed to be working in government procurement. Um, sounds like you want to form a company with the state. Uh, is that correct? We can do that for an extra $25. Uh, if we're just setting up a corporation for you and that's it, we don't require any documents from you at all. This is not the way it's supposed to work. And in much of the world, this is not the way it works. Uh, in key parts of the world, this is exactly how it works, and, and, that, and, that's, that, and that's what's typical. So um, uh, this was not at all unusual. I guess just the brazenness of it. We can, we can make it anonymous for $25, Canadian, Canadian dollars, not, not US. Uh, then uh, uh, that was a little... Um, a little more brazen than normal, but, but this was not at all out of the norm. Um, okay, uh, in order to understand this, uh, we conducted an experiment. Uh, just like a medical trial, uh, uh, we wanted to get at sort of the causes of compliance with international law in, uh, in corporate transparency. Um, and. Uh, we needed a way, we just, we, 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 this is the only deceptive study that I've, that, I've, uh, that I've conducted. Last week I was at a conference on ethics in social science research, and, uh, and, and this, this project was sort of the, you know, one of the centerpieces of deceptive research in social science. Uh, and uh, we just couldn't figure out another way to learn what we wanted to learn without deception. Um, we considered recruiting confederates that had legitimate business interests interest in doing this, but our, our university council barred us from doing so uh, because, they, uh, because they didn't want to expose these confederates who would, would have been students at Brigham Young University to any kind of legal uh, repercussions. And so uh, they said, no, you will use aliases instead. You will, you will use deception, which we were fine with because it gave us more control over the experiment and also, uh, mo more importantly, shielded our, our research assistants. So, um, we wanted, to, we wanted to behave normally. We wanted to learn what would happen if we, um, uh, if we, or if we, if we asked, if they thought they had a, a legitimate business interest with us. Um, so, uh, as with the medical trial, when you randomly assign treatment conditions and a placebo, um, you can you can learn whether or not the, the treatments cause any change in behavior. Uh, so, you know, with a, with, a, with a new drug that you're testing, if the treatment group gets better and the control group doesn't, well, then you know that you've got a, a successful drug. Oftentimes, the treatment group gets worse or has side effects, in which case you can also learn from the trial. Um, the, the power of experiments uh, comes in the random assignment. So when you randomly assign conditions, uh, the randomization mathematically, almost magically, uh, balances all of the other possible confounding conditions across all of, the, all of those, uh, all the possible factors that might confound across those different experimental conditions. Uh, and so you can be quite confident that any changes you see between the treatment groups and the, and the placebo group uh, are actually the, caused by the treatments themselves because everything else is identical on average. Uh, now, there are ways in which that can go wrong. Uh, we used a very large sample to, to try to, try to uh, guard against that. Um, but this is the way you learn causal effects in, uh, in science and in social science. Um, so here's what we did. Uh, first, we got ethics clearance from the Institutional Review Board uh, at, 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 at my university, Brigham Young University. Um, and uh, this did not necessarily mean, mean, mean it was ethical. It meant, meant it was legal. <laughs> 
No, there's lots. Sometimes the, sometimes the difference between the two. Um, uh, we generated aliases using the most common male names uh, in 21 different countries. Uh, and then we sent emails to, it was actually 3,700 uh, different corporation services, uh, corporate service providers uh, around the world, 182 countries. So this is the, as far as we can tell, this is the very first global field experiment uh, in social science, uh, where, where the whole world was involved, or, or virtually every country in the world was involved. Um, and we, we varied the information we gave. Uh, we gave different information to, diff to different uh, experimental uh, groups. Uh, and we wanted to learn if any of those, any, any of that information actually changed what they would do with us uh, in response. Uh, so um, as, we, as the responses came back to our inquiries, we could categorize them into different, into different you know, uh, uh, categories or codes. Um, the, the majority, or nearly the majority, about 50% about, about did not respond at all to our uh, initial inquiry. Um, and uh, that was uh, the modal category, the, 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 the most uh, um, frequent category. And uh, it turns out that, uh, that most of those that didn't respond would not respond even if we didn't ask for anonymous incorporation. So we went back to them after we didn't hear from them. We went back to them months later using a different alias uh, from one of our innocuous, uh, what we call North Australia countries. We went back to them and asked uh, if they were just in, if they were still in business uh, and if they were assisting customers. And about 85% didn't respond even to that most innocuous uh, possible uh, inquiry. And so most of these non-responses just they, they either weren't doing business internationally, or were or were distracted, or just weren't answering your email. So, uh, so um, it, the non-response um, category is, uh, uh, is a little problematic, but, but less problematic than we thought, just because they're just not responding. Um, the second category is the one that we're most interested in, which is non-compliance. Uh, this is where they say ole, right? You know, uh, they just let us through with anonymous uh, uh, anonymity, right? So they don't ask for any identifying documents whatsoever. Um, there are other categories, of, co of course, of interest. Part compliance where they ask for some identification but not, not, not require that it be notarized. Um, compliance where they ask for full, identif full identification with notarized documents, uh, usually proof of address notarized as well. Uh, and, and then finally, they can just refuse to do business with us. Uh, and, and, and actually, uh, among those last four, they're, they're about equally dis the, the, the responses were about equally distributed among them. So of the half that responded, about 10% in each category, or 12% 12, 12 in each category. Um, OK. Uh, we've had lots of criticisms uh, saying, how do you know that this is real, right? So, so what, of course, we you know, very vigilant not to commit any fraud whatsoever. These are aliases, so of course we can't pursue uh, any, of these, uh, any of these possible transactions. And so as soon as they told us what documents re were required, we said, thank you, our, our needs have been met. Uh, and, and, you know, implying they've been met elsewhere, and, 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 we, and we terminated the, the communication. Uh, so um, some have worried that maybe, maybe the, the corporate service advisors would actually change their minds later in the, in the process. Uh, and, uh, and actually ask for documents, um, uh, which is a reasonable concern. I, you, you know, you're in the industry and know that probably doesn't happen. Uh, and uh, just because of, you, know, you need to be upfront with your clients about what you expect uh, uh, from, the, from, from the outset. Um, my my uh, co-author, Jason Sherman, actually in a prior audit study followed up with 45 companies and went all the way to the end of the process except actually wiring the, wiring the funds. So he knows exactly what they were expecting throughout the whole process. Uh, in three cases, he actually did follow through and incorporate in his own name, so there was no fraud. Uh, and uh, and in, none of those, in none of those cases did uh, any corporate service provider change their, change their requirements uh, during the process. So it was consistent throughout. Um, and So um, our subjects, uh, experimental subjects, were these 3,700 firms, uh, about 2,100 in the U.S. and about 1,600, uh, I'm sorry, 1,600 in the United States and about uh, 2,100 throughout the rest of the world. Um, and uh, we mostly found them. We put the subject pool together with Google searches. So we're, we, we, we searched for uh, incorporation or, or corporate law or business law. Uh, and, and then put the name of the country that we're interested in, uh, and then whatever companies came up, that's where we got our contact information. So, um, uh, and uh, we, did, uh, we did a little technique, a, a statistical technique called block randomization. So we put all of the, all of the law firms uh, 
and all of the um, just you know standalone corporate service providers in different bins, and then did a ram randomization in each of those bins to make sure that there was balance as much as possible. We also did the same uh, by country groups. So we took all the OCD countries, put them in one bin, all of the tax havens, offshore uh, uh, financial centers in, in one bin. Uh, I realize that's the, that's the better term to use than tax haven, especially with this crowd. But trust me, in this case, tax haven is a good thing. You've got to believe me, and I'll show you later why that's so. So uh, um, you want to be a tax haven in this study. Um, so uh, uh, we also looked, uh, looked at them according to their ease of doing business right, for the developing countries. So tax havens, uh, OECD countries, and, uh, and then three different levels of developing countries based on their ease of doing business uh, ratings uh, by the World Bank. Um, and we randomized within those different blocks. Um, it's probably too, ins you know, too uh, insider-ish um, uh, social science uh, uh, nerdiness, but uh, it's important for the, for the, the integrity of the study. Um, all of the, the treatment conditions we compared to a placebo condition, uh, which, was, which we called North Australia. Uh, and and uh, North Australia was, was these eight countries uh, that are all among the, the 10 least corrupt countries, according to Transparency International. Uh, they're all minor powers. Uh, none, of, none of them are, are G7. I guess the, 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 among, the, among the, you know, the 15 least corrupt countries. Uh, and uh, so none of them are, are, are major powers, and, uh, uh, and they're all uh, wealthy. Uh, and you know, they're scattered throughout the, throughout the globe. We didn't see much difference among these countries at all. Uh, there were very few um, what we call fixed effects, where one of these countries showed up as significant in any way. Uh, and uh, in general, they were treated very similarly. Um, and then, we, and then we, even in the placebo condition, we asked for confidential incorporation. Uh, and we asked what documents would be, were, would be required to incorporate. We thought that was important, because otherwise we just kept playing cat and mouse. Right? They just wouldn't tell us what documents were required. So we just thought it's better to come out and ask. Uh, we tried it once when, when, we, when we didn't ask for documents. And we got even lower compliance rates than I'm going to show you in a while. Right, so it just took a long time to go back and forth. Um, okay, so um, uh, our first treatment condition, we actually mentioned international law. We thought perhaps these, com these companies are not following the law because they don't know what the law is. Uh, we later followed up with a survey of the same 3,700 companies throughout the world, uh, and we only got about a 9% response rate. So we're, and it, when it wasn't representative of the 50% 50, 50 we got in the, in the experiment, but uh, of, of that 9%, only about two-thirds of them, oh, I'm sorry, uh, two-thirds of them had never heard of the Financial Action Task Force and never been briefed uh, on its regulations. Uh, so, uh, and, my, and, and my suspicion is that one-third, you know, they're all in the offshore financial centers, right? So, um, uh, or many of them. So, um, uh, we, so we told them about the international law. We said that it requires disclosure of information, uh, identifying information, but then we said, but I'd really rather not provide it. So... You know, that's, I mean, you know, the question is, are, are, we, off, are, we, are we inviting collusion, right? That's, but we, we thought, just, just tell them about international law to see if it makes a difference. Um, uh, we also have what we call the premium treatment. We essentially offered them a bribe, right? We will pay a premium to ensure confidentiality. Uh, and uh, one of our, one of our uh, uh, advisors, as we put in the study together, said, I don't believe anybody's going to violate the law. He's a real b big believer in international law. Uh, and uh, he said, you, you better, you better actually, actually make it worth their while. Right? And so this is, what, this is what this was trying to do. Um, uh, we also, uh, actually, uh, I didn't origi originally have this, but after hearing Dan Reeves uh, earlier today, you know, I went back and added this, uh, this condition so I could show it to you. What if, the, what if the, uh, the alias, or what if the potential customer came from the United States? Would there be greater vigilance? Uh, Jason Sharvin, my, my collaborator who has you know, been involved with this, uh, you know, with this work uh, for about a decade, uh, was really sure this would have the strongest treatment effects. Uh, that that the, the coming from the United States would, would, be, would be very sort of you know, uh, a stark uh, for, these, uh, for these firms and that they would, they would less likely do business with, with, with a US citizen. Um, and so that was, that was the intent behind this one. Um, we also told them about the Financial Action Task Force rules, and then we said there might be penalties applied. So we invoked the possibility that there might be legal sanctions uh, and w to see if that would make a difference for them. Uh, but again, said we prefer not disclose information. Um, uh, for the 1,400, 1,600 services in, in the United States only, uh, we, on the IRS, IRS website, it says that it's, it, it's a partner with the Financial Action Task Force and, and all of the uh, FATF uh, investigations and, and, uh, and, and um, 
and enforcement. Uh, even though, you know, it's not clear that they do much enforcement since it's really state law that governs incorporation and not the federal, federal law. But it says it on the website, so we put it in, in, in the treatment. I uh, said so that the U.S. law enforced by the IRS uh, requires disclosure of identifying information when forming a company. But again, I'd rather, I'd rather not provide it. Um, um, to motivate the next treatment, uh, I want to uh, make you remember a story uh, called Anglo Fleecing. Uh, it happened in Kenya. Kenya was trying to, to, to modernize its passport system, which was pretty antiquated, uh, and, it's, and it, and it uh, invited bids uh, from, and these were, these, were, these were closed bids, sealed bids. Um, and a French company bid six million uh, euros. Uh, a British firm bid 30 million euros and won the bid. Now, I'm just a quantitative social scientist, but that's not, I, don't, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to work, right? You're supposed to go with a low bid, right? Uh, and, uh, but, but, the, but a British firm uh, uh, took the bid and pocketed the remainder, recontracted the, the, the uh, passport contract to the French company, and then kept the, the 24 million uh, euros. So um, uh, this was leaked to the press by a, by a, by a functionary in the, in the Kenyan government. Uh, it was this huge hullabaloo in, in the international press, especially in Britain, uh, but, but the investigation had to stop because this was an anonymous shell. Uh, Anglo Leasing was an anonymous shell company. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, of course, as you know uh, better than I, these stories are pretty common. Um, so our next, our next uh, uh, condition tried to get at this. Uh, we, we call it the guinea stand treatment. So um, uh, the FATF says that you should be very sensitive in the risk-based approach uh, to um, pay attention to the country of origin. Uh, and so some countries are more, so, more associated with corruption and therefore ought to get greater scrutiny is the idea. Uh, and so we picked eight countries that are among the 30 most corrupt countries according to Transparency International that are otherwise, we thought, indistinguishable to most people in the world. Unless you happen to be from one of these countries, you, don't, you can't really tell them apart. Uh, and uh, we called these Guinea stands. So the four Guineas, Guinea, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Equatorial Guinea, and Papua New Guinea, and four of the Central Asian Republics, uh, and uh, uh, the, least, the less famous ones. Uh, and that, the idea was to associate with corruption. We also told them in this, in this condition that, we were, that the alias said that, that he was involved in government procurement. So that was the idea, is that, uh, that they were, um, the alias has said that they were, you know, working in, you know, what is arguably the most corrupt sector of the economy. That should have raised red flags for corruption. Um, the next uh, treatment I want to motivate with, uh, with uh, Musaba Azakari, he's a pretty famous uh, fellow, uh, made the cover of Time Magazine after his death. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, he was a pretty notorious uh, guy. What people I, I don't think realize so well, at least uh, according to, uh, to multiple federal indictments in the United States, is that, is that he financed his activities, not unlike uh, uh, other terrorists, uh, with, a, with a pretty elaborate network of, of uh, associates. Uh, in, in his case, uh, his, um, his henchman's brother and nephew were working in my home state, Utah, uh, and, uh, and they uh, established a, a shell company uh, and they used it to defraud title companies uh, out of you know, a significant uh, uh, amount of money. Um, I think it was almost half a million dollars, uh, you know, the different fraud schemes. Uh, in order to finance al Zarqari's operations. Now, we don't know that for sure, of course, because these were anonymous shells and things get lost uh, in, in the international uh, system. So, um, what I do want to highlight is that the, the, the money in terrorism, money's not, uh, terrorism's not that expensive. So, compared to things like Anglo leasing, right, uh, you know, I mean, these are pretty small amounts. And in some ways, corruption's a bigger problem uh, in, terms of, in terms of raw amounts. Of course, uh, you know, terrorists, uh, do a lot of damage and make people feel really insecure, and so but it turns out it doesn't cost that much. Uh, and so uh, this may be less of a problem uh, for the international financial system than, than is often portrayed in the media, and maybe even in our book, uh, even though we try, we try very hard to pedal back a little bit on that. Um, so uh, we had a terrorism treatment. Uh, and in order to signal terrorism, uh, the alias claimed to hail from one of four countries associated with terrorism, uh, Palestine, Lebanon, Pakistan, and Yemen, uh, and Yemen. 
uh, and, uh, and claim to reside in Saudi Arabia. Because of the cross-border basis, that's supposed to be a red flag for the FATS risk-based uh, assessment. Uh, and, and uh, of course, the kicker, um, the, the alias claim to work for Islamic charities, uh, which have you know, been notoriously uh, fronts for, um, for some terrorist financing. So uh, that was the terrorism treatment. We tried to raise every red flag we could for terrorism in this treatment, right? So. Um, now the question is, if we're telling you about international law, what if we already know, right? We're not, we're not giving them any, any information, and, and that's absolutely true. It turns out that at least our survey suggests that about two-thirds had not been briefed on the FATF standards, and so you know, they, they, uh, this was news to them. Uh, and a lot of those were in the United States, by the way, uh, the vast majority. Um, but, but for the third that actually didn't know, that already knew about the international law, this serves as what psychologists call a priming treatment. It calls to mind information they may not have been thinking about at the moment. And so they may have heard that this was law, but they may not be following it. This primes them on that. And, uh, and I think both, both ideas are consistent with the, with the notion that international law ought to matter, uh, even, if, even if one, uh, they're not getting new information. So, um, all right, let me tell you what we found. Uh, and then I'm, I'm hoping we can have a, a robust discussion uh, and, uh, and, and you can give me uh, uh, feedback and ideas and I can answer questions. Um, so, um, let me, I'm just going to give you one piece of information. Remember we had those five different outcomes. Uh, there was no response at all. There was, uh, there was non-compliance, part compliance, full compliance, and, and refusal. Um, I'm going to show you data based on just the non-compliance measure, right? That's the one where, you know, they offer, essentially offer anonymous shell companies. Um, and we, we, we did something we called the dodgy shopping count. So what we did is we, we took that proportion of, of firms that offered anonymous shells and inverted it, right? Basically telling you how many firms would you have to uh, contact before one would offer you an anonymous shell in each of these different conditions, okay? So, uh, example, right, if, if, uh, if a given condition had a 5% non-compliance rate, that would be equal to a dodgy shopping count of about 20, right? So, uh, and um, uh, so just remember that the higher the dodgy shopping count, the, the more compliant with international law uh, that condition induces or, the, or those countries are. Okay, so higher numbers are, are, are more compliant, more law-abiding than lower numbers. Uh, okay. So here's what we saw across country groups. Um, you can see here that uh, the offshore financial centers, the tax havens, are three times more compliant than the OECD countries on average. Uh, that is, so the offshore centers, is not a, not a surprise to many of you in, in this audience, are following international law uh, in, in some cases perfectly. Right? We, did, we did not find a single instance of violation of international law. In, in many other cases, they're among the most uh, law-abiding uh, uh, across nationally. Um, what's surprising, what surprised us, that, didn't surpri this, the, the, that outcome surprised me a little bit, didn't surprise Jason. Um, what surprised all of us was the developing countries, so poor countries, were significantly more compliant on average than the wealthy countries in the in Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Right? We had thought that uh, the, the conventional wisdom goes, uh, Tax havens don't comply because they're scoff laws. Developing countries don't comply because they can't, right? They, they lack capacity. And OECD wealthy countries comply because they can and they're interested. Wrong, wrong, wrong. All three counts, um, at, least, uh, at least according to our data. Um, and as far as we know, I think this is the most comprehensive data that exists on the topic just because you know, this is a different way to approach it. The way the FATF does it, which I think is valuable, is they just look at the, at the statutory, you know, uh, um, rules on the books in countries and then give countries ratings based on how well they do uh, according to statute. Um, but whether or not the, the laws are on the books does not tell you actually what the firms in the, country, in the countries actually do. And so in, in this sense, you know, our, our measure we think is a, a more uh, truthful measure of what's going on in the world. Um, so here's the, here's the league table, and I realize that it's pretty, it's pretty small print. Uh, apologies for, to those of you in, the, in this side of the room. Uh, but I'll just walk you through it a little bit. Uh, you can see that um, uh, some countries uh, never offered anonymous shell companies. Now, now, they did it in different ways. So Denmark has a perfect record. 
here, but almost all of Denmark's firms uh, asked for, for, uh, for ID but not notarized. So they had a very high, a very high part compliance rate, even though they had no non-compliance. Uh, so so, you know, so they're, they're, they're here for different reasons. The Caymans, the Bahamas, uh, um, and, uh, and the Seychelles, which were the three most compliant uh, offshore financial centers, um, they almost always asked for notarized documents, using, using multiple, multiple notarized documents. So, you know, passport picture, photo notarized, page uh, from, the, from the passport, uh, in addition to uh, proof of address, and usually some kind of bank, re bank reference. So they were asking for all of the documents. Um, now, other places just refused a lot. Right? They just said, you're kind of sketchy. We're not going to deal with you. Uh, and, uh, and so they're, they're, just remember, they're, they're there for different reasons. Uh, but you can see the tax havens in general, the Isle of Man was, was quite high um, and, uh, in, in terms of the compliance rate. Um, U.S. Law, law firms actually did pretty well. Uh, but, um, see if there's a, but you can see here, U.S. and corporation services, corporate service providers in the United States were nearly dead last in terms of their compliance with international law um, and, and, uh, in an offer, offering anonymous shells. An extraordinarily easy to get an anonymous shell company in the United States. Yes? We did, go through, we did go through state by state. I'll show you that next. So, so I, I got state by state in a moment. So we got a league table for the US as well. So, so uh, uh, and you can see that, that the countries down here Right, typically, or the, the, there's a disproportionate share of them that are OECD. So UK is right here, right? Poland, uh, Australia, um, you know. So these are, I mean, th these are Canada is right next to the United States. Uh, so one of the few areas where Canadians can't be or can't feel uh, t too superior here uh, in terms of following the law. Um, so only Kenya was worse than Canada in the U.S. So. Um, Okay, and here's the state league table. Uh, again, re remember that, that the states are complying for different reasons. In my home state of Utah, I had a perfect record, but they either were refusing service or just ignoring us, right, and not answering. Okay, but n I mean, almost no firms asked for notarized ID. In the United States, I think 10 out of 3,000 contacts, right, so an incredibly low rate. Uh, very few, I think it was something like 30, uh, asked for uh, non-notarized ID, so, for, so any, kind of, any kind of proof of identity not notarized. And so, you know, and typically U.S. firms were not part compliant or full compliant. They were either, they either refused or they ignored us. Uh, or they just, you know, let us through, right? Uh, and that was, that, was, that was the mode category in the U.S. was uh, after, non, after, after no response was, uh, was non-compliance. They just, very few state laws actually uh, require, no state laws that we know of require notarized identification. Uh, and that shows up here. You can see, um, whereas, whereas the, the usual suspects, you know, at least according to conventional wisdom, showed up as the most compliant in the international uh, subject pool, here the usual suspects are right where you would expect them to be. Right? Delaware, Nevada, Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, uh, and then some surprising ones, right? So New York, uh, California, Pennsylvania, not exactly, you know, you, you wouldn't think that they're quite as notorious as, as these others. And then some of them uh, up here, you might not expect as well. So, um, but, uh, but, and we did every state, this, is, this just shows the states that we had at least five contacts in, or at least five responses. Uh, so we didn't, want, we didn't want to bias it based on a, on a, on a low, on an especially low uh, um, uh, response, number of responses. Okay. Um, now, what I've shown you so far is what we call observational data. That was not necessarily uh, um, subject to the treatments themselves, but because we balanced those treatments across the conditions, we, we thought we could pr present that data and you could see wh what it looked like. Here's the response to the actual experimental, experimental conditions. Um, so here uh, at the top is the placebo, uh, and you can see what happened with all the different, uh, different treatments. So we, we, we tried to make it harder to get an anonymous shell company by, by providing information that ought to alert uh, our subjects to you know, a possible impropriety. And we did not succeed. Right? The premium condition w was higher than the placebo, but not in a statistically significant way. So this, wasn't, this, this doesn't reach conventional levels of, of significance statistically. Um, only the terrorism treatment succeeded in making anonymous corporation, uh, incorporation harder, but not that much harder. Okay, so uh, it, it didn't double 
right, the, the base rate of compliance. Or non, it, didn't, it didn't make you know, non-compliance go down by half, I should say. Uh, instead, you know, it, was, it, was, it was less than that. So it turns out that a lot of uh, firms were still willing to offer anonymous shell companies to, you know, to characters that looked very much like they could be terrorists. Uh, some of them even picked up on it. I'll show you, I'll show you that in a minute. So, um, so, uh, so that was in, in the international uh, subject pool. Here is the, here is the, the, uh, the US subject pool. Um, the only two conditions we saw, and there's other conditions I didn't show you here because they're more academic. Uh, 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 we had 10 different treatments. Only two of them actually made an anonymous incorporation more difficult. Uh, that was the terrorism condition in both the US pool, whoop, in both the US pool, i got to watch which button I'm pushing. <laughs> it draws slowly. Uh, both the U.S. pool and in the, uh, uh, and the international pool and the IRS condition. So when you, when you raise the specter of the IRS, they're less non-compliant, right? They're less, less likely to offer anonymous shells. But again, not that much less, right? Statistically significantly so, but not, uh, but not in, a, in a huge substantive uh, way. So, um, and uh, to give you an example, uh, f since we're here in Florida, uh, one of our one of our subjects wrote th wrote this back to us, and I, I've taken out most of the <laughs> most of the profanity that was included in this e in, in this email. Um, Your stated purpose could well be a front for funding terrorism. I wouldn't even consider doing that for less than five thousand a month. <laughs> Some of them knew, right? Uh, and we're still willing to offer anonymous shells to somebody they think might be a, a terrorist if the price was right. Um, okay, uh, to wrap up. Turns out this is easy. It's not, not a big surprise to many of you, uh, although in your own countries, it probably is much more difficult than, than, uh, than it is in, in my country. Um, uh, tax havens, uh, offshore financial centers did significantly better in this measure than, than, the other, uh, than the other countries. And developing countries sometimes did better uh, than the developed countries. Um, when we increased the risk, we typically did not make it more difficult to get anonymous shells. Um, what would happen generally is we'd get, we'd get lower response rates. So people, people would write back to us. But it was the ones that would have been compliant that weren't writing back. Right? They would have asked for ID that weren't writing back. We often saw a, a, a decrease in the, in the actual compliance rate, the rate at which people, people demanded identify, identif identif identification documents. Um, so uh, we also saw reduced compliance rates. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think what this did, uh, we didn't expect this, but what this did is it signaled to some firms that we were willing to collude. You know that I know that you know that I know that this is inappropriate, but we're just going to do it anyway. Right. That, that was the signal that, that we, we think might have been sent to some firm. Now, other firms obviously picked up on that and dropped out. But, but the bad ones, turns out they'll sell anything to anybody, right? even, even, even potential terrorists. Um, that's what I have. Yeah. Questions? Dr. Nelson, you started off with one of your opening um, slides talking about um, compliance with international law. But it's perfectly clear to, everyone, to us all that these individual agents, you know, the people doing the incorporations, were all operating under global domestic. Exactly. Now, um, exactly. And, uh, if you accept that, um, isn't your opening assertion in respect to this presentation completely flawed? Because there is no such thing as international law. Well, that's not true. There is international law. It just doesn't matter very much. No, no. T tell me what, 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 who was it who passed the international law? And who is it who uh, uh, polices this international law? Yeah, so there's two different things here, and right? There's, there's, there's statutory international law, there right? and there's a rich body of international law in, in, in terms of statute, right? Treaties, right? They exist, right? And, and this financial action task force is what we call soft international law, right? So, but, 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 it's, but it's rarely policed, and that's exactly right. So, so it's not law. No, with respect, it, it, it's not international law, unless you can tell me which government, which parliament, which assembly passed it. Well, so what are you talking about? So, so, th so there, there are realms of international law that actually seem to have real teeth. Right? So one of the areas that I study is the World Trade Organization. Uh, and there, there, there are quasi-judicial proceedings that are brought. And firms are, you know, uh, you know I mean, important sanctions are levied against them. There's a, there's a system that actually seems to function. But, 
right? Well, and, and, it, and, it, and it was a global parliament, it right? It was, the, it was the World Trade Organization that, that, if you that agreed think on that. that works, it only works because individual countries, as their own jurisdictions, have ratified some treaties Precisely. and have put things in. So right. that's domestic law. It's not international law. Yeah. That's, that's the first thing. That, that is correct. And so secondly, um, uh, it, it, anyone who knows the history of the FATF knows that from its very beginning, it focused on the financial flows and it went after the financial institution and the banking structure. And uh, by virtue of the identification requirements for the opening of a bank account, the view was taken within, in F FATF that issues related to shell companies were of less significance because the shell company could do nothing unless it opened a bank account. And when it opened a bank account, the banks were under domestic legislation, which bit very hard, the money laundering legislation, which you preferred to in your compliance framework for the FATF, with criminal penalties. So um, the view taken within FATF over the shell company issue was that it was irrelevant. It might be a first hurdle, but by and large, it was of no relevance to the movement of money. So, um, uh, you know, you, you actually went after the wrong um, um, culprit, if you were after a culprit. You should have been sending this stuff to bank managers saying, I want to open a bank account. That would then have told yeah. us something useful about how the FATF banking system worked worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're quite correct that there is a major criticism of the FAT evaluation process across the world on an international basis that it looks at the way the laws are written, it doesn't look at the way they're implemented, and it's dependent upon money laundering and criminal authorities in each jurisdiction about money laundering offences that are pursued through the courts and all of that to test effective implementation. Right, so, right. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, I th my next question to you is when are you going to do a proper job <laughs> and, and do another 3,500 can I open an anonymous bank account, and then when yeah. you've done that, will you come back and tell us something useful? Because I don't think this exercise so far gets even close to that. Well, so, so um, we're considering uh, a, a study of banking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are bigger legal questions, in part for the, for, for the, for the reasons you raised. But I, I don't know. I mean, I mean we can, you, know, you, you can ask yourselves in the audience. I mean, do you really think that an incorporation is irrelevant? Right? And, and I don't think most of us here believe that, right? that, that, it's, that it's useless right? or, or, or worthless. Um, now, I agree with you. The banking study would be, would, would be, more, would be more telling. Um, but I do think that, that it's not clear to me uh, that, that banks um, are, are, are entirely vigilant uh, in, in identifying uh, beneficial the owners. Banks. The banks are. It's not clear to me. And until the study's been done for the banks, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So well, people keep asserting that, yes, they are. Well, yeah, the banks you know are, right? But we, we don't know yet. And, and, and what I suspect is that they're pretty good with individuals, but my, my, my I also suspect they're not as good with, with corporations. And, and, and I don't know that for sure. I, I, all I have is anecdotes. Until we do the study, we won't know. But I do think uh, incorporation does matter. There are lots of things you can do with corporations uh, the, in, in terms of the movement of money. money that put in, in one final point, that, that when you break down the incorporation law into its proper framework, which is a national, in some instances, state-driven framework, um, you, can, you find that there is a, a well-established arrangement which, in if I can take the British, the English, the English example, because it's England and Wales, um, it is that the notion of incorporation in England and Wales was that it should be made as open and easy and flexible right. and simple as possible. Right. And matters about whether or not um, there was a, a, a Mickey Mouse name um, would all come out in the wash because the business about... Um, addresses for the receipt of documentation and whether or not the person was really Mickey Mouse um, would come out in the banking. Yeah, yeah. The right, right. Now, now, I mean, it turns out that, that, that the ease of doing business, the ease of incorporation yeah. is only weakly related to our findings here. Yeah. So that is, the countries that are actually more vigilant in, or that, or that make incorporation easier are not necessarily less compliant with uh, incorporation law. Well, it depends so, whether or not they ask for identifying information that's notarized, or whether you've made up that requirement as an international legal requirement. Which you, you see, the point I'm making at the very beginning is there is no such, such a requirement. You go to establish a company in England and Wales, you don't have to send in a notarized... Right, so, so international, there are international standards that govern that. Uh, so you're not, denying, you're not denying there are international standards, are you? 
but you may tell so, me that because that's, because that's, that's a different okay. story, right? So the international standard, wh whether or not that has any teeth, right. is exactly the right question. Right. And it turns out that it does have teeth Quite. in the offshore financial centers. That, that in those cases, they have instantiated international law into domestic law, and they enforce it vigilantly. And they must, right? I mean, we're, I mean, anecdotally, we know that, and it certainly seems to be the case, yeah. right? So, so that, their international law really has mattered. It hasn't mattered a lick. International standards. International standards, soft law, right? So it hasn't, matter, it seemed, it hasn't seemed to matter much in the OECD countries that actually perpetrated the laws in the first place. So there's a, there's, there's a massive piece of you know, international hypocrisy going on here which I think is, is pretty interesting, hiding behind is, is international legal standards that are not enforced in their own countries. That, that's a big problem. Because they're, they're regulated. I mean, in the offshore world, company management is treated, regulated by the same people who do banking. Exactly. Insurance. That's, that's it's exactly right, yeah. Delaware, Delaware corporations have been regulated by the SEC. Right. Or, or by anything. Or by banking. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So yeah. you've, got a, you've got a horribly different infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. Nobody to sort of check the money laundering, yeah. even if there was anything not In the United States, uh, there's no license for a corporate service provider, right? There's the, you know, I mean, to, 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 to uh, act legally, right? I mean, you have to, I mean, to have a law firm, you've got to have a license, but you don't have to have a license to be a corporate service provider and well, to contract with those law firms. Are you suggesting that, that, there's, that, there, that there should be? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, I actually think that it, it's possible. I mean, I, I don't know. Right. I mean, uh, that th th I have, uh, I'm, not, I'm not at all libertarian, but I have certain sensibilities in that direction. And, and you know, and I don't know if you should do that. I mean, what was interesting to me is that, is that there doesn't seem to be much of a relationship between the ease of doing business or incorporating a business and, and uh, anonymity in business. Yeah, I, right? I so think the underlying notion was to make the protection of limited liability available as widely as possible sure. to promote economic yes. activity and growth. And that, and that actually might be a very good thing. And, I, and, and so, which I don't, I don't know if we should regulate. I, let's put it this way. I can think of lots of good reasons for shell companies, right? And to get rid of them would be, would be a, I think, a disservice to the international financial system. Um, I can think of really very few good reasons for anonymous shell companies. In fact, I can think of none. I can think of no good reasons for anonymous shell companies. You know this better than I. Please, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, yeah. That research is, is, is great, uh, provides great information because I've seen in structures that uh, some companies in a chain of corporation, in a, a global group, uh, some companies do not even have a bank account. So that extra step of, of doing the same exercise, opening a bank account of an amount at least $10,000, you're going to need, need a big budget. To do yeah, that. that's the challenge. Because uh, there's some threshold in some countries yeah. where you don't have to demonstrate or uh, certify the, the, the source of the funds yeah. uh, under a certain amount of dollar. I think some, some countries yeah. are $10,000 uh, and then yeah. you have to tell, you know, yeah. to explain the source of the funds. Right. So I've seen in, in structures where like company A is, is, is um, not anonymous, a uh, company B is, uh, it doesn't have a bank account or other companies in the group are s acting as a bank for the right. one in the right. Yeah, and so I, I think I think we probably most of us can probably agree that incorporation is is an important piece of this, um, but it's not the only piece. And I'm very interested in the banking piece too. Uh, we'll see if we can actually do this. I mean, the, the question is, can we do it legally, right? And and can we do it uh, ethically? Uh, and so and so I think what we can do is we can establish shell companies in lots of places, and then try to open bank accounts in you know legally as agents of those shell companies. In which case, I think we can do that without any legal repercussions. But then the problem is, you know, the banks in the United States at least need to, need to file suspicious action, right? Uh, um, you know, uh, advisories to the IRS. And we just don't want to waste their time or the IRS's time. I think we can notify the IRS we're doing this, and they probably would like to see the results, especially internationally. Um, but, but, uh, but, the, but, you know, and the question is, ethically, can we take people's time of filing those, you know, those uh, suspicious claims? And, and, you know, I don't know if we can. I mean, I, I have to worry about that. Illustrate that point you're making by your example of, of, of the Kenyan passport scandal. Right. Um, because the, the, the bulk of the investigative work um, didn't stop when they discovered that it ran to an address in Liverpool. 
the, because there have been financial transactions through the banking system. Yes. Um, and, uh, and the fact that it was an anonymous company in Liverpool was of no significance whatsoever to the investigation which pursued um, the flower funds through the system. So, um, it, you know, you've, 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 you've pointed to the tip of the iceberg yeah. without talking about all the work that went on at the subterranean. Yeah, yeah I'm, interested, I'm interested in what's going on under the water. Right, I'm very interested in that. I, I mean, so far, you know, uh, we haven't been able to, you know, develop a research design that can get at this in an ethical and legal way. Um, but we're working on it. Um, I'm very curious. I mean, do, you, do you think the banking study would be, you know, a value one? And do you think that it, it that we can do it in an ethical and legal way? Right. Those are the two questions. Um, and I'm very curious and very interested in your in your feedback there. So. I don't think you could do it unless you get formal legal immunity from the Attorney Generals of each of the countries. <laughs> oh, I don't even want to think about that. So, yeah, and, and they will not give it, by the way. <laughs> we know they're not going to give it. So, um, I think, I think, I mean, remember, this is a pretty low-level inquiry, right? We're just asking, what documents do, re do you require? And we do the same thing with the banks. We wouldn't actually open bank accounts anywhere. We'd find out what they required from us before we, before we went, right? And so, but I think we, need, we still need to do that without, without, without uh, uh, deception in, in, the, in the bigger sense, right? I, um, I still think you'd have the FBI knocking at your door the next morning. There's no doubt. I mean, and, and when we were doing this, you know, the Department of Homeland Security was hitting our websites, right? So I think they, they you know, they never talked to us, but, but uh, we were talking to people at, in, in Levin's office at the Senate, so they, they kind of knew what we were up to. Uh, other, other questions or comments? Well, except except that all of the all of the countries are, are, are also if countries are not a member of the of the FATF, then they are a member of, of one of the regional organizations that's associated with the FATF and they've instantiated all of their standards as well. So virtually every country in the world has signed on to the FATF standards. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean that they're doing it. Exactly. The United States is exactly. a great example. Right, like, right. Russia is another one. UK, right, a bunch of, uh, they're, just not, they're not doing it, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, from, from, from what we can tell, the countries that are actually in compliance with the law are those offshore jurisdictions that have had lots of pressure, right, from the OECD countries, especially from, and from, you know, with the FATF as the front, right, to, to conform to the international standards. Uh, and they clearly, I mean, so this is not, a, I, mean, I would never say that the FATF has, has been irrelevant, right, because they have really mattered in terms of, you know, the OFCs, right, so they have really, you know, uh, um, pressed hard for that. And clearly the work, you know, an, an important amount of work has been done by those, by those countries in their, in their domestic laws to, you know, to, to, um, you know, uh, instantiate and, and enforce these standards. What, what's, what's, uh, the tragedy in this is that lots of people are making lots of money, right, off the system and people doing bad things with their money in this system. But, uh, but they're not typically doing it, right, uh, at least with anonymous incorporations established in offshore financial centers. That typ typically, that's not, how it, that's not how it works. I think the problem you have is, yeah, all those standards mm -hmm. exist, and that's all very nice, but it's probably not actually changing. Well, that's what we found, right? So, well, it, it seems like, I mean, so if, if we'd done this study 20 years ago, I think we would have found a, different, a very different compliant rate, compliance rate among, among the tax havens. Yeah, but does right. that mean that, that crime has gone down? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, just looking at general trends in crime, it seems to have gone down across the board and, you know, for, for other reasons. But I don't think it's necessarily because of the FATF. But it, it's possible, right? It's certainly harder, right? I mean, right now, you just snap your fingers in the U.S. and you get an anonymous shell. If it were harder, it would probably deter some criminals, right? Not all, but some, right? The, the, the ones who are opportunistic, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I just think that unless you, unless you have laws and enforce them, 
you should expect crime, right? <laughs> and then when you have laws that enforce them, you're probably going to get less crime. So. I, 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 I'd have to disagree. But my sense is, and this is just from my experience of having been in enforcement, right, a right. compliance, I do fraud investigation, your passport and your address really doesn't stop what crime is. I mean, quite honestly, I have three passports. I'll give you the passport that you want. It doesn't mean a thing. I mean, quite honestly. Even notarized. Well, it's, it's a, it's a, a paper passport. passport. I mean, you're not going to be able to do anything. It's a paper passport. It doesn't mean a thing. Stamp, I get a notarized. I got somebody in my staff. They stamp notarized things all the time. It, it doesn't mean a, an address. I got the same excuse. I have no nothing in my name. Okay. So, <laughs> you could write a book, right? How to money launder. Right? <laughs> I just give you my driver's license. Yeah. Look, for a fraudster, it really yeah. doesn't make a lot. There's a, there's a bigger thing is things like source of money, knowing where your money's coming in, monitoring accounts, yeah. and that's got lost in all of this because everybody gets with a little pick box about passports. Yeah, I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Yeah. Has been notarizing. Yeah. Somebody notarizing your utility bill. Really? I mean. Yeah, I think I think it's harder to fake if if it's notarized, but I, it's certainly not impossible, right? And, and very motivated criminals will find a way around all of these standards. Uh, and uh, you know, and, and that's why you need active, you know, investigators like many of you that actually you know do something about it and make it make it really bite legally. Um, but but this I, I think this might suggest something for what the opportunistic sort of easy crime. Five thousand dollars a month. There you go. Yeah. Problems go away. Other questions, comments? I really appreciate this uh, feedback. It's very helpful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>